I'm going to separate Paul and Barnabas. Yes, please. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. I'm not putting us under, but that's what the scenario demands. So I will be. Yes, please. Please sit. So the arrows you have sharpened this evening, of course, it's not for me. You should know your target when you throw them. Praise God. All right. Again, welcome, Pastor Kay. Welcome, Pastor Mildred. We already have avalanche of questions here for you people. I pray that God will give Pharaoh answer. Amen. All right, the first question is, I'll just ask the question, two of you are one, you choose who will answer it. When I feel hot about something, my husband did and said to me, is it wrong to speak up and let my husband know what, and let, is it wrong to speak up and let my husband know what then do I do when my husband is difficult and hardly understands me? So it's two questions in one. First, when he does something wrong, should I speak up? And then what do I do seeing that he's a very difficult, hard to understand man? Okay, praise God. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Kosfini. Uh, Pastor Da is not around yet, but thank you for having us. Um, so that question, funny enough, is a common question. Um, a lot of women feel that their husbands are difficult. And I don't think that's the right term. I think the term is their husbands are different. And that's what Pastor K has been trying to explain all weekend. That just because someone is different from you doesn't mean that they're necessarily difficult. Um, he doesn't understand you. He's not you. That's why he's, you feel he's treating you badly. Um, so there are a couple of things you can do. Number one is pray. And like I said this morning, don't pray about your husband. Pray for your husband. Um, number two is you can praise him for the things he's doing well. Um, men respond to praise. So if you find something that he's doing well, praise him for it. Um, another thing you can do is project on him what you want him to do for you. Take the initiative and do it for him. If you want him to speak to you kindly, speak to him kindly. If you want him to greet you in the morning when he wakes up, greet him in the morning when he wakes up. You know, just kind of curate him, retrain him. Um, another thing you need to do is be patient. You need a lot of patience uh, for him to be who you want him to be. And then it's not wrong. Um, let me not say it's not wrong for you to speak up. However, timing is key. You have to understand timing. You have to know when to speak up. So for instance, and how. Not just when, how as well. My husband is a, his personality is a sanguine, so he's very, he needs positive energy. So if he does something bad, I have to find a way to say it in a playful manner. If not, he's going to feel attacked, and that would totally defeat the purpose of what I'm trying to achieve. So if he's done something wrong, I have to find a positive way to bring it to his attention, or a playful way to bring it to his attention. So you need wisdom on timing, how to pass it across, and then do all the other things I've said, and I hope... You know. Thank you. I, I don't know why it's looking like every question is man, 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 man. Are men this difficult? Okay, it said it's because men don't talk. Uh, okay, men have asked questions, so, but that's your business. They are thinking it in their mind. Ask anything you want to ask. When you come home, we'll sort it out. <laughs> Praise God. All right, the second question is what do I do when my husband finds fault? In almost everything I do, it really makes me feel not enough for him and hurts my self-esteem. All right. Um, usually when that kind of thing is going on, it's not because he doesn't like everything you do. He's probably somehow your relationship is affected. And um, I don't know, I think I mentioned something like that yesterday. When a man is happy with you, he doesn't see any wrong thing you do. And when he's also upset with you, he doesn't see any right thing that you do. So something is wrong or strained in the relationship. Um, you can ask him what he would like you to do better. That's a good opener. You know, you're not focusing on his own faults. You're focusing on, okay, how can I be better? Most men will talk at that point, you know. 
Um, that's one. Another thing, you can ask the Holy Spirit what you need to change. Sometimes you, he, the manifestation of the problem might be manifesting in how he talks to you, but the cause of the problem might just be, you know, how you are talking to him or something you are doing that you are not even aware of that is the trigger to all this drama. So you can also ask the Holy Spirit, you know, um, what I need to do to make um, things better. So that's just basically it. There's a reason he's upset. And finding it out and adjusting that reason will make him begin to, you know, open up again. Are you, are you, are you hearing it? Huh? This is why you're calm. As if the question is pitching you, the answers. Another question is husband again. Men, please ask your question, sir. What does loyalty and respect mean to a husband? Because... It seems I and my husband, I and my husband's definition is, is not aligning. He always feels I don't respect him and I am not loyal. And this leads him to shout and insult me in people's presence whenever he is angry. He's hot-tempered. Okay. Um. <laughs> Let me try, even though I'm not a man. <laughs> but I know that um, women's definition of respect is not necessarily the same as men. So what I always tell wives is um, a man does not feel respect. A man is not respected until he feels respected. No matter what you are doing, if he doesn't feel that he has been respected, you haven't respected him. So you cannot dictate what respect is for a man. Um, the easiest way to go about this is to ask him, you know, sometimes we ask questions when we can simply ask the person. Just ask him, how, what, do I, what do I need to do that will make you feel respected? And not in a quarrel, you know, because when he does those things, my guess is that you are defending yourself. Not at those times. Don't have those deep conversations at those times. When you are playing, say, hey, you always say I don't respect you. What is this respect in self? You know, say me, I don't be man. Just tell me, explain to me, how would you feel respected? You know, for some men, you'll be amazed. Let me give an example now, and I'm not using respect per se. Um, when I first got married, I was brought up to believe that if you want your husband to be happy, you have to do literally everything. That's what a wife's role is. So a wife should cook all her husband's meals. She should serve all her husband's meals. She should make sure all his things, she personally takes care of everything. And so when I got married, I was doing that. I wouldn't let anybody serve my husband. I wouldn't let anybody cook for my husband. I wouldn't let anybody clean, do anything for him. I was literally doing everything for him. And I was also working with him in the office. After a while, I literally broke down physically. I started falling ill. And one day, my husband called me and said, do you know that all these things you are doing, they are not important to me? He said, somebody can cook. At least if you make soup during the weekend, they can boil rice. Even rice, I won't let you fry plantain for my husband. It made me feel less of a woman because I had been trained that way. So after a while, he called me and told me, he said, what will annoy me more is if you die. Because before I found you, I suffer. So if you die, you are going to give me more stress. So it's better you do only the things that you can do for me. Just with me. Sleep with me. Talk to me. All those other things are not so important. And I was killing myself for no reason. So now I've learned that I can do the things I can delegate. I delegate. But I wouldn't know that if I didn't ask him. Now, that's not the same for all men. Some men want... So everyday rice, everyday food. They don't want microwave food. They don't want... My husband doesn't mind. If you, as far as you cook this, it's okay. Even if you don't cook it and you taste it and it's sweet in your mouth and you serve him, he eats it, you know. So I had to ask him. So that respect thing you're asking us, every man is different. And so I may say greet your husband in the morning and that for him may not be respect. It may be your body language. That even though you greeted him, there's a way you did your face and passed. He didn't like it. So you ask him. Some other times, it may be the way you talk to his mother. You may even be treating him with all the respect. When he's passing, you lie down for him to climb on your head. But when his mother knows, you just, or, or she calls, you just see her number. You just, that for him is disrespect. You don't respect my mother, you don't respect me. So everything has, you understand? So ask him, and not when you put a in. Ask him when things are okay. Yes, I'm sorry to add. And um, from the tone I get from that question, it seems you are dragging position with him. You are saying he's idea of loyalty and respect is not your own. Uh -uh. Um, if you want your marriage to be peaceful, there can't be two captains in that boat. All right? You need to own your position. 
Yes. You need to own your own position. What women need to understand is that men are territorial positionally. Women are territorial emotionally. All right? Men are territorial positionally. Women are territorial emotionally. So you are dragging position with him. Let him have... Men, men are not even particular about control. Most times it's women that still control the family. It's women that control where we live, what we do. Women still control it. But men want that position. That's the only thing they need. So give him the position. All right? Give him the position. So you stay with the control. So there shouldn't be an argument what respect and loyalty means when there's a king in the house. Let the king tell us what respect and loyalty means. And that becomes what it means. Now, once you satisfy his own, you can start bringing other aspects to it. And he will take it with joy. It won't be a challenge. Remember I told you in the morning, men are fighters. He would rather do what is wrong just to win the fight. Because he fights by default. That's how he has survived all his life. So don't fight him. From the tone of the, this, it looks like we are both bringing suggestions. Mm -mm. God gave you the secret to controlling a man is by submitting to him. All right? Let him know that, okay, you are the head of this home and we submit to you. All right? Now you, they ask, now you know the club. What are the answers you club? Because the questions, the answers, are, they are making me feel like allowing him to dwell there. Now you ask Samo, Namide equate. Number four, still on husband. Husbands, are we here? Husbands, we ask him. Is he still on us? How can I trust my husband who is not transparent with me but hides and deletes his messages with other females and claims he doesn't want me to read meaning into the chart? Okay. Um, unfortunately, um, during the course of this conference, I didn't have time to go into all those kind of things. Um, however, there's already something wrong if there's phone being, um, chat being deleted and things like that. That means there's, there's a trust and transparency issue in the marriage as a whole. Um, you guys need to have a serious conversation about how this marriage ought to be, the kind of vision and guidelines and kind of marriage you guys want to have. A marriage that is instead of building on covering things, it's going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. Once you start hiding, you need more lies to cover more lies to cover more lies. That's how lies work. So um, try to see if you can sit down and have a conversation. If he's the kind of person that is submitted to authority, you guys might need to talk to a counselor or talk to your pastor. Or talk to somebody that can, you know, let him understand what marriage... A lot of times... Some, people, some parties in the marriage don't understand how marriage works. He said they were both naked and they were not ashamed. The real concept of marriage is that we are up, supposed to be 100% transparent. So if you are having to hide something, you know, it's already a bad sign. And if you're a man here and you're doing that kind of a thing, um, that's not how marriage is. You're already building a faulty foundation for your marriage. And you're not being an honorable man at all when you are covering, um, you know, hiding things. You must build that marriage on the basis of transparency and trust. And you are literally um, killing a woman when you are doing those kind of things. Um, even when everything is peaceful, her mind is moving around. How much more when you are now doing movements that we can't understand? Uh, she's literally not sleeping at night, I can tell you for free. She's using all her witchcraft forces to try and, uh, you know what I mean by witchcraft? <laughs> You know, to try and uh, monitor what you're doing. You are stressing her for nothing. And whatever you are involved with that you need to hide, it's already obvious that that thing is something you should not be doing. So, um, so I think you have to open up to him. From the woman's side, there's nothing much you can do except, like I said, see if you can talk to him to understand how, how, I want to, how do you want to run this marriage, what are the terms and conditions, and how this is not fair, and all that. If you can talk to somebody of a higher authority to talk with him, if that can be done, that's a good um, option. All right. Okay, let me just add that. I think that also your reaction um, over time, because I hear you say he said he doesn't want you to read meaning into it. Sometimes there may even be nothing going on, but when you have seen something, you are, if you are the kind of person that can't control your emotions, you're overly jealous or things like that, it's very hard for a man to let you in on things that may look a bit funny. 
and you are endangering yourself because if he cannot let you in on those things, when there's a real problem, you can't help him. So it's important that you are able to manage your emotions and be the kind of person that your husband can tell anything without you jumping over. Eh, that's why I say nobody, don't greet anybody when you go to, just relax, let him talk. Just be going, eh, okay. But you know what you're going to do after that. But just be <laughs> nodding and saying, oh, really? Mm, that girl, mm, she doesn't look this sort of, eh, okay, no problem. Then you know where you go and call her name later. How can you scrub, cover this truth? It's nowhere you will go and call her name later. I didn't hear altar. Thank you. I didn't hear nowhere you go and corner her later. <laughs> Are you getting me? Uh -huh. Did you say they should engage in a fight? No. Okay. It's, easy. it's easier for God to fight, too, because God fights correctly. You just fight anyhow. God knows where to hold this matter and deal with it. That is will get solution. Number five, still on man. What role can a man play to make the home a happy home, especially with a partner that is not considerate? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, my own question to you, what role can a man play when he's married to a woman that is not considerate? Yes, so my own question to you, uh, Mr. Considerate, is how did you consider marrying a woman Who is not considered. that was not considerate? How did you arrive at it? So it means that somehow there was something good you saw in this woman at some point. So uh, you need to be sure that you are not the one triggering her, triggering her to be inconsiderate. Is there something you're doing that is making her behave that way? If not, then you need to start loving her again the way you loved her before. The solution to every problem in marriage is love and respect. If she's behaving somehow, love her. You will love her into change. If he's behaving somehow, you respect him into change. That's what God said. First Peter 3 he said, if your husband is not even behaving according to the word, he said, you that you are spiritual. You be you, you have, you are considerate. He said, use that your considerate behavior to change, <laughs> to change the person that is inconsiderate. So that's how it works. Whenever you come to God with a case, it's you he talks to. The other party is not in the meeting. It's you who will talk to. Say, go and love well. Go and love more. Go and love again with this love. Because that's the only... Um, master key that even God himself uses to change this world. For God so loved the world. That's the medicine. You know those medicines they sell in buses that cures everything? How many of you know I've seen that those buses before? Where they sell one tablet, it cures high blood pressure, romanticism, arthritis, uh, my malaria. Hey, one tablet. God's own is love. That's what he uses to cure everything. Whether you're a bad person, a good person, you're trying, you're not trying, his only solution is love. All right. Very good. All right, the next question is, is courtship relationship, is a courtship relationship where a party does not relate with the family of the other party, what sustaining? You are in a relationship with a party, whether man or woman, and your partner is not relating with the other partner's family, is such relationship what sustaining? I think, I, well, I think that it's, it depends on you, you, how you want your family. Um, if you're a person that's close to your family and you don't want that thing to spoil, if you don't want to be separated from your family, then I don't think that relationship is going to work. Because that, if the person is not relating well with your family, um, <coughs> there are reasons why. Possibly doesn't like your family or, you know, and I'm, and I'm assuming she's not just... Um, an introvert. Not that she doesn't like your family, you know, it's just that she doesn't know how to. There are two sides to that. It might be that she doesn't know how to. But if you are saying she doesn't relate with, meaning she doesn't like them, then I think it's dangerous if you like your family because you, you'll be expected to balance both relationships and it will be hard to. This is one of the reasons why God told Solomon not to marry strange women. He said, if you marry strange women, they will draw you away from me. They will draw your heart. So if you marry someone who doesn't love your family, um, eventually, you will be drawn away from your family. So I think it's a dangerous move, you know. But to be honest, it's still up to you. I don't know whether you two don't even want to relate to your family, so you're looking for an excuse. 
Yeah. So, uh, and the main thing is to find out why. If you didn't tell us why, if you could tell us why he or she is not relating with your family, then we could know what to do. If they're just not relating because they don't like to or they don't want to, then that's a big problem for you. If you like your, you like Barack Boy, you like family. Uh -huh. So, but in a courtship, a courtship is a rehearsal for a marriage. So, if he's not willing or he or she's not willing to do the things that matter to you, that, that in itself, you know, I suspect there will be more. A relationship that is working well can't just have this problem. There are some problems that are always a, yes, always an offshoot of a real problem. You know, this one, this kind of problem doesn't just appear from nowhere, where two people are really in love and everything is going fine. I just say, I just don't want to talk to your family. It's, it's rare. It's usually an offshoot of, and sometimes this person, are you even sure you are dating him or? Because there are many people asking for questions, they are dating themselves. <laughs> the other person is not aware we're in a relationship. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm a counselor, and I'm telling you, many times. Somebody will give you a big question like this about her, if, as his or her fiancé. But then you call the person. The person will say, I'm not even aware we have started a relationship. I'm not. She's just my friend. <laughs> Praise God. Are you being blessed? All right. Number seven again is for men. Why is it that it's only through domestic violence that it is assumed that life is threatened? Isn't infidelity also a threat to life since a lot of spouses have transferred HIV to their partner? Also, men involvement with dangerous ladies outside their marriages who use a lot of fetish means have endangered their wives, their wives' lives as most of them do things to get the wife out of the way, including sickness, death, I know two women who were victims. So, why isn't infidelity a threat to life as domestic violence? Okay, very good question. Um, just to reiterate again, even domestic violence doesn't 100% mean you must break the marriage. Okay, it might mean you might need to separate so that you will not be killed or beaten and then something be done to try to reconcile or manage the situation, okay? Sometimes, even when we've got involved in domestic violence cases, we find out that the party that they are beating, it can be man or woman, the party that they are beating is also contributing a lot to this beating. It's only in rare cases where you greet somebody, good morning, and they slap you. It's in rare cases. Most other cases, both of you are encouraging this issue. Maybe the woman will go and hold the man. You're not going anywhere today. Jack is shit. You will kill me today. And you know men are literal beings. They don't understand direct speech. You will kill me today. He will say, should I start now or in the evening? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you are jacking his shirt. And you know most times when people tell these stories, they don't tell the full story. As a counselor, we know that. When people just say, you just beat me. You just wake up and start beating you. No. <laughs> so by the time we find out, if you are doing something that is causing this beating, we will also counsel you on how to relate with this man. We'll cancel him to see whether he's ready to change, if he understands this is bad. So I'm not, I never said that um, physical, domestic violence must mean lead divorce. However, we might need to first bring you out, if it's consistent and continuous, and you know, work on it. Now, um, why is infidelity not a reason for divorce? I, again, there is no biblical reason for divorce. Maybe except, like I mentioned, if the person wants to depart. Okay. The whole concept of divorce was always to protect the person left behind, not the person that wants to go and work out. Are you getting what I'm saying? From the Old Testament where it started till New Testament, the only key is that if this man doesn't want me again, they said, okay, free this woman. Not the person that wants to go, that they were protecting. They were protecting the person that was left. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. So that's what they were trying to do. So um, infidelity is not a reason for divorce because... If the person still wants to stay within the marriage, you must find a way to work with it. People, people find it hard. When you say for worse, like I told you in the morning, when you say for worse, can you give me a list of the worst that is okay? Which, which worse is recommended? Worse is worse. Worse has no beginning and has no ending. I don't know if somebody gets what I'm saying. Marriage is a covenant. This is what we are telling people. People don't take it seriously until they are inside. They, when they are gingering to make vow on the altar. Do you do? I do. They are gingering. They don't know what they are committing to. 
Nobody is reading the fine print of what they are committing to. You are entering a covenant. A covenant is a serious matter. Anything outside of painting or understanding marriage as a covenant will be very useless because I don't have to wait for infidelity to leave. If, if I feel emotional torture, somebody can say my mental health is being affected. I can die. So that's the same as uh, it can live. Somebody can say, in short, you are not feeding me well. All the food is not sweet. I've been losing weight. I don't want to stay here and die. So this thing you are saying, they have already done it. This is what, the question they were asking Jesus, that should they, should they, can you divorce for any cause? This is what brought the question. People were now divorcing for every reason. Because you say it's a HIV. You're not say, but they have food. Is it not poisonous? Somebody will pull salt like this. Not be high blood pressure. You won't give me. <laughs> I don't want to die. You understand? They, they took it from where it started to any reason. She's too fat. Or she's too black. They found a way. So God didn't give that loophole at all. It's a covenant you enter seriously. Most people don't want to pay attention to what they enter. It's coming out. They are now checking the paper. Which escape clause? You should have read before you enter. Because once you enter in the eyes of God, there's no reason to live. All right? So, don't, I'm not saying if they are killing, beating you in the house, you must stay there and die. No. You can come out, talk to people that can help, let them find a way to resolve the matter and all that. But if the husband or wife is willing to stay with you, in the eyes of God, there's no grounds, no scriptural grounds, at least, for, for divorce. Um, I would still like to say carefully because you can't you know I'm, I'm trying to be careful because you know what people will not carry your insta blog drag your life <laughs> but but the truth is um there's a difference between a kingdom marriage and marriage mm. there's, a, there's a difference between christian marriage and what people are doing out there what pastor k is defining to you is a christian marriage a Christian marriage is till death do us part. The reason why, you know, that clause is there, that till death do us part, is because it's covenant you are entering into. Most people in the world consider it a contract. In fact, they have a prenuptial. If you disturb me too much, I go. If you do this one, I go. They have two years trial marriage in some countries yes, now. Two yeah, years trial marriage. Yes. If it doesn't work, you go. Yeah, so there are things are really, they're really messing marriage up. Marriage isn't what it's, what Pascal is teaching is what marriage should be. Marriage from God's eyes. Because when two of you get married, God doesn't see you as two individuals anymore. What God sees is one person. Pastor K is now my head. I'm now his body. He's no longer Kingsley and Mildred. He's now Kindred. So when God sees us, he sees one person. Now, the only way you can separate a head from his body is what? Is death. So that's why we're talking to singles. Before you enter, know what you are getting into. Because you don't just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm done. I can't, I can't take it anymore. But those, it, it, see, you can't, you can't be done. I always tell people that thing. Now, waiting them put for fire and I ain't they done. You, are, you can't be done because it's covenant. Now, I know you are saying, oh, there's sickness, there's this thing, they'll give you HIV. I do know that in your vows, you were saying in sickness and in health. These are out of your mouth, your lips, we, we judge you. It's what you said. Now, I am not in any way encouraging infidelity. I'm an infidelity recovery coach, and I have seen damaged women, which is why I'm saying these things more, more like this. Because I've seen women who, even me, I'm tempted to tell them, and still be going. Marriage is not by force. Don't come and go and die. There are other things in your life. First be alive. I know someone who was driving to go and kill herself. That was bad. I said, but even though I asked, I said, why, why is your choice suicide, not murder? Why don't you want to kill the person that causes you the pain? Why do you want to kill yourself? But you see, it, these things are real. They are real. So the issue isn't how do I get out. It's look well before you enter. That's what the real issue is. Because when you enter and you say you are a Christian, God expects you to stay there and be Christ-like. What have you done to Jesus that he has walked away from you? That's the problem, oh. It's not how do I come out. Is HIV not? It's well, mental health, it can kill now. Verbal abuse can kill. Someone doesn't have to, sometimes what people say to you with their mouth does more damage than somebody slapping you. 
So all of them are bad. All of them are problems. That's why God wants two of you to understand marriage, know what you are getting into, know that you are, as, you are choosing a life of service by loving this woman. Love her till she blossoms. Do you think I don't have bad behavior? I have. It's love that they're using. It's my medicine every day. You just give me small dose of love. If he sees that I'm not behaving well, you add more. <laughs> Do you understand? If I see that he's annoying me, I put respect. That's when you hear me call him sir like 25 times in one statement. Sir, please, I don't know if you can, sir. Maybe you should think about what I'm saying, sir. Because, sir, the way you're behaving, sir, I don't believe in sir, 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 sir. And he will, he will pay attention. Do you understand? So I'm not saying that if you feel that you're about to die, you should stay there. Do you understand? Some people can't take it mentally. You may need to, like he said, take a break, but not break the marriage. You may need to take a break for your health, for, to get yourself back, to be able to fight, energy to fight the marriage, but don't, go, don't enter without knowing what you are entering, because it is in sickness and in health, and in all, even if you remove in sickness, and, I don't want to confess negative, in all other circumstances. Yes, it's inside. Do you define the circumstances? All others. Mm. So all other circumstances is there. So you have to know what you are getting into. That's the real issue, not how to get out. Make sure where you are going in is, in, is the right place. God bless you, Jeff. All right. <laughs> I, also, <laughs> praise God, I also want to still add again, because um, I think the question really is, is there a route out? So people are thinking of what is the escape route I have if I'm stuck? There is none. That's what we're saying in the eyes of God. Except the person has left you, then you are free. If he's still inside the marriage with you, you are inside. Uh, <laughs> except you want to be the one that wants to leave somebody, then you are. Uh, you know that's not what you want to do if you are a believer. So, me and my wife have an example we always give. If you are in a room like this now, for instance, and there is no door and there is fire catching somewhere inside this room, your first reaction will be to go and put off the fire. But if there is a door, your first reaction will be to run out. So, what you're asking me is that is there any door? Uh, there is no door. <laughs> Let's go and look for ways to put off the fire. that fire. Yes, Right. All right, number seven. Why is it that it is only through domestic violence? I've done that. Yes. In a situation where you find out that you are the only one driving the family and to some extent doing dual chores, praying alone, and my spouse feeling nonchalant about it. What, what to do? Because I tried many times to teach her with the scriptures, yet she hurts more. I don't understand it, but I think yeah. we do. Do you want to? Okay, it's what we've been answering um, all day. So I think we should just even read it in scripture so that you would understand what we're saying. Whenever you come to God, I've answered this thing 100 times today or this week. Whenever you come to God to complain eh, about marriage, since your partner is not in that meeting, God will talk to you alone. alone. He can't be talking to you about the person that is not there. God is not a gossip. Uh, he's not a gossip. So you need to understand. This, this, these are the issues people don't... I wish sometimes... Pastor, I wish single people can cancel married people. And married people can cancel. Because all singles are desperate to marry. Many married are desperate to become single. Yeah. They are all admiring the other person. So if they can cancel themselves, I want to marry somebody say, mm, if your husband is doing this, can you stay? If he's doing this, because that's what I'm going through. Me, I want to even come to where you are. <laughs> because when people are on this side, single side, they are the one pressuring us. Don't marry by all means. When they've crossed, they are also pressuring us. That they're looking for escape route to change. No, it's a covenant. And when something is not going right in the marriage, there's one solution. DJ, I don't know if they can put a scripture for us on any of the screens or something. First Peter 3, you know, from verse 1, we'll just read it all. There was a situation like that, and the advice God gave to the person is still to do your own side. That's how to correct a bad behavior. Is it on the scripture? I can't see. So, DJ, I don't know if you can put it on the side for good. It says, wives, likewise, be what? submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not what obey the word so this is the case you have a spouse that is not obeying the word that is not doing all these nice things we are saying what's the solution they answered you here they said that even if some do not obey the word they without the word may be won by what the conduct of their wife so husbands you can also turn this to husbands okay this unis you can make it unisex they can be won by your own conduct look at the next verse 
They said, when they observe your word, chaste conduct accompanied with respect or fear. Look at the next verse. It says, um, do not let your adornment merely be outward arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on fine apparel. Next verse. It says, um, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, which is the, an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Next verse. It says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted God also had done themselves, being what? Some say, meaning they had done themselves with good behavior. Not just jewelry, but good behavior. Not bone straight, but brain straight. <laughs> Next verse. It says, um, so Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him what? Lord. Whose daughters you are. Say, if you do good and are not afraid without what? Any terror. What they are saying simply is that, hey, your husband doesn't have the word, or your wife is not behaving with the word. They say, you, who are, you have the word. You are spiritual. You are the good person in this marriage. Abi? They said, use that your good behavior. Continue with it. They will change because of your good behavior. The more they see you being respectful, in spite of when they are being disrespectful. Jesus said it all through scripture. Don't return evil to evil. Overcome evil with good. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Don't ever give fire for fire. So if they are being terrible, you just be nice. They are being terrible. There's a story of Smith Wigglesworth, um, Smith Wigglesworth's wife. Smith Wigglesworth was one of the greatest apostles of faith. But before he became born again, he was a very bad person. His wife was born again. And his wife wanted to go to church. You tell your wife, you're not going to church. I know the Bible says you must submit to me. <laughs> and the woman will say, that's not true. That um, I will submit to you. You're my husband. You're, my husband, but you're, not, you're my not my Lord. All right. That I have my first allegiance is first to God, oh. then to you. That I must first honor God. So she will go, go to, to church, church and he will lock her out yeah. and she will get home. And I know they lived, they lived in the UK then. The weather was crazy cold, if you know anything about that. So they will sit, she will sit outside the, the house, sleep outside in front of the house in the cold. And the morning he will open the door, she will enter and still greet him. Say, Good morning, what will you have for breakfast? Or she will set up her, his, her, his breakfast. Somebody that locked you out and you slept outside. And she continued praying for him. And he said all those times, it was like they were pouring hot coals of fire on his head. Because he was, many times, people are looking for your fight. They need your own ginger. If you quench it, try and try it anywhere. If somebody says you are an idiot, if you don't, if you say, sorry. Hey. It will just kill their... They want you to also say you are an idiot, then you will push you, then you will push back, then punch will start. They need, everybody needs, nobody just stand zero to hundred by themselves. It's rare. So she kept doing that thing until he started touching him and he got saved and he became one of the greatest apostles of faith. If it was today, now she would have left the marriage instead of fighting for it. And, and we'll lose them. Many of you are married to an apostle of faith. The same way he's stubborn now, he can be also be stubborn for the things of God. Uh, but you are not patient. You want him to change. Even though you promised I do. To do now. You don't want to do. You are the one that say you do. So um, you be, obey the word. Whether you're male or female, okay? Keep doing what is right. Your own doing what is right is what will change that person. Thank you. Put your hands together again. Okay. This is another question for the fathers. What is a Christian father supposed to be doing with baby's placenta after it is removed? Does the scripture support this? I don't know. Okay, there's no scriptural um, injunction. All these things are traditional stuff people inherit. As a child of God, you must um, be able to identify more with the kingdom than just tradition. There are many things people do that I have no scriptural basis that you have no business being involved with. So um, we don't do anything with placenta. It's just a whatever, you know. So don't, don't, don't let them wage that war in your mind. Like I said, I think the first day I came, that, you know, we're worried about what they buried in the village instead of being worried about what God buried for us. Mm, we were not in the, any of the burial ceremony. We both we heard about both, but you chose to believe the one in the village over the one in Calvary. It's both buried. They bury somebody. Mm. Their own is goats. They bury it as rotten. The one they bury for us alive. is still alive. So if anything hasn't happened to the thing, you can come and correct it. And he may leave it to make intercession for those that are Hallelujah. saved. So don't worry yourself about that. Stay with the word of God, okay? Very important. Okay. Pastor K, you've answered that question, but you didn't tell them what to do with the placenta. Because what happens in the hospital is that immediately after the birth, the doctor or nurse will carry it in what I and give to you. Okay. Then find out from other people. Um, in most places, they, you, if you are burying it, then you are burying it out of just taking care of it. Not that you are carrying out a spiritual or religious um, action. 
So do you understand, guys? Okay? If you are burying it, then it's that, okay, they just want you to dispose it as you see fit. Okay? It's not that you are taking it to, you're burying it as a charm. I don't know if you get what I'm saying, guys. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Don't, don't make a big deal out of it. Find out how other people are burying their own. And bury your own like that. Yeah, uh, it's not, but don't turn it to a, you are doing a spiritual exercise. Mm. Or you are doing charm. Mm -mm. It's nothing like that. Please let's um, celebrate Bishop Jude in the house. <laughs> Praise God. All right, the next question. What's your take on surrogacy? Now that's how you for so. <laughs> okay, the question is, do you guys first understand what surrogacy is all about? Okay, I know I pastor intelligent church. So, what's your take on surrogacy? Okay, personally, I don't see anything wrong with surrogacy. Um, in fact, let me explain it to them so that they will be understanding okay. it. Surrogacy is couples that are not they are unable, they are to, unable to give birth, unable and to carry their own children. To carry their own so children. Maybe the woman is getting pregnant, but she's miscarrying. Different things are happening. Yes. So they place the embryo. That's the husband's sperm, the woman's egg, and then it has become an embryo. They now put they it through IVF. And put in it another, inside someone else. Another woman, person to carry. To help them carry and then give Deliver birth. the baby and they now collect the Usually baby. Usually through C-section. And then they now carry their baby. That's what she is, she's answering. Okay. <laughs> so personally, I don't see anything wrong with it. Why? Because it's even scriptural. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a surrogate for God. She carried the baby for God. Yes. And so, if you ever find yourself in that situation, interestingly, I don't see anything wrong with surrogacy. I don't see anything wrong with adoption because we're all adopted. When did God push you? I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God. Which day pushed you? Hey, you adopted. Yeah. It is what Jesus did that gave us rights to, to now become, become children. children. He's the firstborn of us. Yes. So we're all adopted. So when people say things like, oh, that child that is adopted, okay, they are real children in court. That's your real child. Yes. That's your real child. So there's nothing wrong with surrogacy. There's nothing wrong with adoption. There's nothing wrong with IVF. There's nothing wrong with C-section. So do not allow anybody put that on you. In fact, Apostle Paul said, let no man trouble me, for I bear the marks of Christ on my body. So they see, let me tell you, the, the problem is people are traditional. So you see people who even had C-sections to save their life now feel as if there's something wrong with them or there are less of women because they did not push and do it the vaginal birth. Sometimes those women are in labor for 24 hours, sometimes almost 36 hours, and then the baby's heart rate is dropping. So it's an emergency. It's not even by choice. And it is a major surgery. If you know what God did for you, that you came out of that surgery alive, you will come out and give thanksgiving and not hide it. So I've seen a lot of people lose their lives because somebody say, I want her to give birth like the Hebrew women. How do you know how the Hebrew women gave birth? They said before they even arrived, the baby came out. Are you sure it's not CS? They did not do labor. So before we start saying things, let's be clear on it. So, because when, this thing where you ask me now, they make me very well, well. Because I, I deal with it on a regular. You see women almost dying. The husband say, eh, it's not their maid that is pushing south. You've been in labor. Do you know what they're going through? My first child, my, when I was having my daughter, Davida, before Pastor Gay, they don't even ask, before they see, they ask, uh, come and sign something. I had preeclampsia. It was a case of life and death. Before I could, she was born a month before she was due. I was still speaking English. They don't roll me inside yet that, oh, you both they follow you, they do that one. Now, because they ask you a question, yeah, that's why you say, I will not sign. She should push like other people. I will not sign. Pastor Gay, you know, if you, before, they, they, that's in your head, yeah, before you be sign, the king don't come out. Because they're always about the life of the person. So there's nothing wrong with surrogacy if you cannot carry your children are not formed in the womb, they're formed in the heart. So that child is your egg. The child is your sperm. And even if it is not, if it's a child that you adopted, it's your child. So carry your child. I know many women, one woman asked me a question. I was, in fact, I was, I was confused. She asked me a question. She said, and the reason why she's thinking about adoption, not adopting is that when she now has her own child, what will she do with the child she adopted? I say, you are, you, are, you are on alcohol. And the Bible says that you should avoid alcohol because there's excess. Why would you say, the child that you adopted, how is that a child that is different? That's your child. 
Just because you didn't push the child doesn't mean it's not your child. I told her, I said, don't you dare adopt. Don't ever try it. Because your heart does not have the love to handle a child. Thank you. Another question. <laughs> this surrogacy is the surrogacy that probably the wife has issues. There's no egg. Something has chopped the egg. The, woman, the man has something. And they want to go and borrow egg. Don't you are talking this in formal, formal law. Donor egg. There's a donor egg somewhere in the donor yes. in the bank. Yes. No. There's one 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 girl Not, by the back of the street that they want to no. borrow her egg. So now that's where I have a problem. And that's where I want you to explain it. Where I have a problem. Where I have a problem is when it is not done legally and in the correct order. Go to a proper fertility clinic and let them help you screen eggs and you pick not somebody that's my sister my younger sister it's as if she's the way her body is, she has plenty egg let's collect from her so that it will be in the family no 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 that's setting yourself up for problems in the Tomorrow. future because in the future whose child is it really is it auntie that gave us egg or you that the child is calling mommy then tomorrow you and auntie will quarrel then she use it to insult you know be me give you egg if i won't carry my picking i will carry my picking they talk to me and me because they don't they call you mommy because human beings are human beings, and human beings are wicked. Desperately wicked. So, if you're going to do it, there has to be, and there has to be le legal papers that you will, see, during the period you're carrying my child, you will not sleep with your husband. There will not be mistake that you will not say, oh, you mistakenly slept, so the egg shifted, then your own egg entered. Then stories that touch. My, my, my younger sister produces movies. She, just, she produced a movie called Mama Drama on this surrogacy issue. That the team entered K-Leg. Somebody helped them carry child. Then after a while, her husband was going to wash. She now quickly slept with her husband. Not knowing that the one they put inside had, had gone. Her own now entered. She gave birth. Gave them the child. Only for her, many years later, the one she had now died. Then she came back and saw that. Uh -uh. This child resembled the one that died. So could it be? They now found out that it's really a child. They, this matter, I'm telling you like this, was in court. Court to collect child back. Child that has, was now almost 10 years that has lived with another family, a rich family, you that you don't have money to even feed yourself, you want to drink, you want to go and carry a, a jabot and put inside one room apartment. Thank you. So you have to be careful. There has to be legal papers. You have to do it the proper way. Go to a fertility clinic and do it properly. So another question. <laughs> we have to flog this matter. This one. Otherwise, <laughs> this people. <laughs> the surrogacy the same kind of surrogacy that the man is fertilized is okay, and then they want to implant. And then um, this lady that they are implanting inside, carrying this baby, who is the lady? And what will be the lady's profession in the eyes of the Lord? A profession. Yes. What, you know, a lady, a lady. A lady is not married, though. Is not married. Her work is to surrogate for people. What's her profession? Interestingly, at the time... Sorry, Pastor Mildred. And the lady is a member of House on the Rock. Eh? And suddenly, she's not married, and she's appearing with a surrogate uh, pregnancy. And Pastor, I will ask, I care. So what's happening? He said, don't worry, it's not my own. I'm just carrying it for somebody. <laughs> Just carry this for somebody. So, okay. uh, what is her profession? What? Interestingly, interestingly, Pastor, it depends on what side of this story you fall on. That's when you become sympathetic. If you, it took me eight years to have my first biological child. When you are looking for a child, any miracle God gives you, if you see somebody who's willing to help you carry the child, you will not even be thinking. How would they see the, if the person is willing? This is a solution for a Your couple problem. who has tried, who has prayed, who has cried, and possibly their faith is not like mine that I was able to build my faith and over over eight years to be able to say, "Oh, I'm going to carry my child in my womb. This is God's will for me." If their faith is not up to that, I don't see the difference between that and adoption. 
Now, the issue is the person is your child. So you, are on the, you fall on the side of the surrogate because she's single. And then what will people say? Because the real issue here is what will people say? I don't even think it's a case of God because Mary wasn't married. She wasn't married when she carried the baby for God. So it's because you are her pastor and you are looking at you, you're a single girl. What will people say? You are not married. When you now marry, well, how will your husband take it? You are thinking of her, all those things. I don't know the reason why she's doing it. I don't know why. But I can tell you that the couple she's doing it for are extremely grateful. And they can't wait to carry their child. And that's on the side I fall on. Pastor Mildred, clap. <laughs> Pastor Mildred, singer <laughs> Kelego. I, I don't think it's such a big deal. If um, our concern is what people will think, people will always stop. And as a pastor, I'm sure you have w ladies in church that have gotten pregnant outside wedlock. Every pastor, yes. if church no big, if your church big, yeah, you go get. Uh -huh. you, so, so we're already doing sorrow yes. things. <laughs> we they do, and sometimes those men that impregnated her have disappeared, or they are no men we can track. So now we go, all of us go still take care of. Uh, we, we have a single mom fellowship in our church, so you have to take care of them. So we're already doing surrogacy. We're just, you know, this aspect of it is just new to us. And we will adopt. It, we adapt, rather. It takes a while, but we'll get used to it. It's not something you should just go about and be carrying baby, you know. But if a family really has a problem with who will carry their child and somebody is willing to do it and it's going to work, it's the same as adoption. Adoption, not be you carry the beginning. You just got the child from somebody. It's the same thing. And it's the same way society frowns at adoption, too, which we don't know why. Society frowns at it, but it's yes, not correct. It's Every child is supposed to grow in a home, yeah. whether you're in a you born am or somebody else. And the truth is that adoption has been going on since our forefathers' times. Yes. Yeah. There are many times that people give birth and somebody takes over the child, even though the person has their own children, but this child, this woman cannot take care of this child. Mm -hmm. They will send the child to you in Lagos, send the child to you somewhere, and you raise the child. I mean, there are people here that even grew up like that. You grew up yes. in another person's house, yes. and they raised you like their own. So we're all just trying to be new to something that has been going on forever. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you. Let me not overflog the issue, but what I'm trying to correct, if I have the permission, is to correct the professionalism in surrogacy, where women go about looking for who to carry baby for and uh, collect money in the name of surrogacy. Okay, because I feel that if somebody has problem of kidney and you willingly, sympathetically, go and donate your kidney. You can as well carry the person's baby who is in a plight. You carry her baby and also give it to her. But when you now stand as a, a, a donor, and if you need kidney, just consult me, and then we are now bargaining. How much is it? 15 million, 30 million? And then you give the kidney. Suddenly, the other kidney now grow a little more. You say, I see half extra. You know, where somebody is down on a, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, commercializing it. Was, uh, commercialize. That's the aspect okay. I want to. Okay, but so I, but I think so. Of. Your issue is more of an ethical issue uh -huh. or a moral issue, more yes. like it's not that it's right or wrong mm -hmm. yes. because somebody can choose, for instance, to give a service for free. Free. Somebody else can choose to charge for it. It mm -hmm. doesn't make it wrong. Go. Yes. It's just that we we feel sympathetic, sympathy that you should at least do it free. If somebody wants to donate their kidney and wants to charge to, to that person that wants to die, he doesn't mind whether he's paying or he's or free. Not. I want to live. On that, on that, but we can say, ah, she is your cousin, she is your friend. But if he says, I know they do it for free, oh, if I go remove my kidney, I go pay. If that's what will keep me alive, I will pay. Do you understand? It's, it's an ethical or moral issue. It's not really a right or wrong issue. It's just that to you, it's like, it's like pastor um, in church. There are people that serve for free. There are people that serve in church to pay. Mm, I know. Uh, say, me, I don't think anybody should charge church. But there are people who instrumentally, they charge. Mm. So you, you see that you want keyboard, you don't want keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> if the only person we have is charging, we will say we will not play keyboard. Do you understand? So it's more of your personal, okay, I don't like that. Uh, reality, anybody can charge for free. There are pastors that you know they charge to come and preach. You know now, you are in ministry now. They are people that if they come and preach, they will charge you ahead though. Yes. My fee is $10,000 if I come and preach in your church. But we, we don't think, me and you, at least I hope that's how we are. We, are. we don't think it's... <laughs> <laughs> Because we don't do like that. We don't think it's right. But there are people that do like that. Some of this music, uh, okay, at least um, Pastor Ike shared it in this morning. Now. Some of these music people that you see come and sing, they charge you. You, you are not singing worship song. For Pastor inviting them, they give you the bill on ground. That is two million for me to come and sing in church. 
So personally, I don't think it's supposed to be so. But at the same time, I'm not the one paying their bills yes. and running their team. They have a large band of 10, 20 people sometimes. Who will feed all those people? So, you know, all these things are... So you be fully persuaded, your own, Thank your you. own mind. Thank you. I, I really wanted us to... Yes, clap. I, I wanted us to flog it mm. so that you will get clarity. Yes. Because sometimes, just like you said, Caesarean and a woman is busy on the labor room wasting her time yes. in the name of one lie that the Egyptian women told about the Hebrew women that before we arrive, just to save people. And, all that. and then you're claiming a lie and you are just there pushing for nothing and the child is dead. Dying. Are you getting me? So no, sit no. there and be cut open and get the child out instead of committing murder. Mm. Are you getting me? So mm. that's why I needed people to know. So that if you have to go for surrogacy, go for surrogacy. If you have to go for adoption, go for adoption. Mm -hmm. don't, just, don't just waste your time. Except you don't want children. That is yeah. fine. You can uh, catch your phone. Sorry, I don't want us to overflow. But I wanted to also say the adoption. There's nothing. I need to say it again. There's yes. nothing wrong, wrong with, with adoption. adoption. Some people have waited. And it doesn't negate your faith. Just because you are, the two are very exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. You can have a, your child and you can adopt a child. And if you are trusting God for a child, you can adopt first. It doesn't affect your faith. Because I know someone who is in our church. My 20 years, she was still in faith. Her husband died two years ago. 20 years, no husband, now no child. If she had adopted, that child would be 90. I need to go get with you all. I thought I thought I bad pass. Now no husband, no child. And after 20 years, she's not a young girl again. That one, that case has closed now, except the miracle of Sarah happens for her. Thank you. Mm. Pastor Kerr, another question is here. Mm. It's a, as a lady, who is, who is, who, lo, who is, Pastor Desa, for they did this thing now. <laughs> as a lady, who is, who loves to see things in a certain way, mm of perfection, mm -hmm. who is also a 21st century boss lady. Mm. <laughs> mm. Come, listen now. I, even me, me that is reading, I can feel the air of arrogance. As a boss lady, you have to tell <laughs> us the name of your boss. So, as a boss lady, how do you deal with your partner who is also an alpha male. You are a boss lady, he's an alpha male. How do you deal with him? Use your boss and jam him. I don't even think, I don't even think this needs long conversation. The Bible is very clear. If you're going to be married and happily married, go and submit to your husband. There can only be one head in that home. Yes. That's all. You can yeah. be a boss in your office. Did when you, you come home, leave it at the door. Enter the house and submit. Did, did, did you hear? Bo boss lady. <laughs> if you were a driver, you should have remained a transporter now. There is a president of Africa that was interviewed. As the president of Africa, the husband was attorney general of the country. You remember, when she was interviewed, she said even as the president, administering the country, she sees over the affairs of the husband. But when she comes home, that she goes to the kitchen as the president to cook for the husband because in her house, she's a wife. Just like she said, if you can't submit as a boss lady, please drive your boss around town and leave driving it into family. Yes. Also, the issue is that, even though this is funny, but uh, this was causing problems in today's marriages. So a lot of these young people... You know, this feminist movement, and by feminism, I don't mean the real dictionary definition. I mean this fake one, yeah. uh, this one are be ones that are looking for trouble, you know. Um, so they are really deceiving a lot of young girls to have this mentality. The Bible is the Bible, and the Bible is what established marriage. So be careful about, the more we move away from God's plan, the more terrible marriages we have. It's very simple, and that's what's going all over the world. You are both lady, that's in your office or wherever you're working. All right, the Bible is clear about how marriage should work. If you're coming in, you submit to the man. Why do you submit to the man? The man is the one that initiates the marriage covenant. All right? He is the one that asks you to marry him. That's why he pays bright price to your family. 
Okay? So he marries you. That's how it works. So you accepted the offer. So you are supposed to like work with him. It doesn't mean you are a slave. It doesn't mean you are inferior. Because this is what people are trying to fight. No, it doesn't mean so. All right? It's just like the same way you enter a plane. I'm not inferior to the pilots, but they say fasten your seatbelt. I will submit. I'm not going to try. Do you understand? Yes. So that's what it is. From time you enter the car. If you enter a keke, you have submitted to the driver. I hope you know. If it's a mad person, you will, you will, the drive will be mad. But you entering is a sign that you have submitted. They, they won't give you your own steering just because you are a free agent. You are a mature What's person. It? They will give you one steering. No. It's only one steering in that car. Once you enter, you are submitting to whoever is driving. So your job is to check well whether the person driving is okay. Drive. And that's your own job. Once you enter, you have submitted to whatever driving the person is doing. Thank you, sir. All right. The next question. If I didn't read your question and it came early, it means I don't understand your English. So let me read from where I understand. It said... I had a child when I was 17, and because of the way I was treated, I am scared of dating any man again. I can't trust men. How do I work on my mindset? Okay. Um, definitely, you, you, it's a good observation. You need therapy. Um, we need to process with you what you went through and help you deal with it. So you are correct by not going into another relationship now. Um, let's process what you went through and what are the lessons, what are the pros and the cons, what kind of healing do you need? A lot of marriages are struggling and struggling because, or relationships are struggling because um, the, pe the woman involved is punishing her next because of the crimes of her ex. Okay? She's punishing her next because of the crimes of her ex. She's carrying over the pain from what has happened to her before. So you are absolutely correct. You need therapy, though, for us to sit down, unpack what you went through, release those emotions, and change your perspective about men. Because right now, your perspective about men has been colored. So we need to rechange it, show you good men. You know there are, there are still good men out there? Yes. But if you're not careful, if all the news you're hearing is bad, bad men, and all the news you're hearing is marriages that are failing, you will think all marriages are terrible. That's not true. A lot of us have downloaded that into our mindset that marriage is bad. There are people that have great marriages and are enjoying the marriage, all right? So we need to work on your mind, so you're right. So you need to therapy, it's not something we'll sit down here and unpack, no. Okay, the next question. What is the situation to my, what is the situation, what is the solution to my money is my money and his money is our money? Situation in marriage, the woman doesn't make financial contribution. Did you get the question? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a common thing. A lot of people just believe that the man's money is our money, but their money is their money. I mean, a covenant, both of us have to bring everything. That's how a covenant works. You bring everything. So even if you don't run a joint account, there has to be joint accountability. We have to at least... You can't be... How, how it, it's, <laughs> says if somebody does not work, you should not eat. How, they are not, it's not men, it's human beings. If you're a human being, you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So if you are working, you should be contributing. That's what they are saying. There should be some contribution that you are bringing into marriage. So as the woman, you can't sit back and expect that the man will do everything just because we say she be naim be the head. The head does not mean, the head brings all the ideas. The head casts the vision, but the head does not do all the work. So every woman, every human being, as far as you are a part of a covenant, what the covenant states is that everybody must bring something. So you both need to sit down and agree um, and I don't even think these conversations were had. Sometimes what happens is that people get into marriage and assume mm. that their partner mm. should know that they too they should contribute. Mm. Especially when you were dating, you were paying for everything, you were doing big boy, you would go declare. She says something you do, then of course she's not gonna change when she enters marriage. Marriage doesn't change anybody. If you are a mar if you are a, how do they say that in uh, marriage doesn't change a lizard to a crocodile, you just be a married lizard. So you can't expect somebody to just change. When, when you were dating, you were doing everything for her. She, wants to do she, she felt you could handle it. And you've never really even told her the state of your finances. A lot of men, a lot of women don't know what their husbands earn. So they don't know what you can handle and what you can't handle. So their expectations may be unreasonable to you, but to them it's not. Because I think my husband can afford it. So these conversations, you need to have them even before you get married. Right. That this is, and that's why you need counseling. Like a church like this, structure. They will ask you questions. How much do you earn? How much do you earn? How, how do you plan to, yeah. to run your finances when you get married? 
What percentage will you put? Do you plan to have a joint account? Those are questions your counselor will ask you. What we think that love, we love each other when we enter, we sort it out. No, you will have these problems. So I think there's a foundational issue. You now need to sit down and have that conversation that we need to now, I can't do everything. And see, there's a, you, um, Bible says that you are my helper. You help me where I need help. I need help. Bring money and help me. I have those conversations and I'm sure everything will be fine. God bless you, ma'am. Peter, add it. Um, uh, Pastor Mildred, uh, let me advise the young people because one of the dece deceits that happen with men is that when you are dating a girl and you love her so much and you're hoping to marry her, you tend to carry the body now. You don't want to speak the truth. You don't want to discuss the fact. You don't want to let her know that if you come into this thing, we are gonna, you are going to take up some body. And you say, if I say it, she will say, I am my Zalik, I am this and that, and she will run away. And you will do everything to keep her. And again, women, when you also bring that up to a woman, and she said, me, I know how, I know I can give. Me, I'm a giver now. I mean, that would be a problem. Let's just get married first. Meanwhile, she's not, she didn't mean what she's saying. So reality check is, is, is important. Man, don't be afraid of saying it. Woman, don't be afraid of accepting or refusing it. If you're the type that want the man to carry the body, <laughs> say it, oh. Say it. Uh -huh. That's okay if you have something. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> and again, friends. like I said, in a covenant, the two of you are one. So everything you both own belongs to both of you. Like Pastor Mildred said, you are now kindred. No more Kingsley and Mildred. You are now kindred. So everything is ours. Both the responsibilities and the, the assets and the liabilities. That's what it is. That's what a covenant is. Again, you know, people are marrying for love and for, you know, butterfly and for society to clap for you. The reality of what marriage is, many people don't know it. They don't fit into it. All right? So, yeah. All right. The next question, even though it's the last, <clears throat> not the last, I jumped to that one. I read scared through questions. Okay? This one says, what is your advice to a lady who feels she has lost herself, bracket, ministry, dream, aspiration, by conforming to husband's preferences, especially as she didn't know then what she knows now? With God, nothing is lost. I don't think in, with God, nothing is lost. I think that um, God has a way of compensating. God has a way of restoring. Even the years that the Palmer woman has eaten, the years that the Kanka woman, that you consider waste, God will still find a way to restore it to you if you will, you know, put yourself in his hands. Um, I know that you feel like it's too late, but to be honest, it's not. From where you are, you can ask God, and God can start showing you what you can do from where you are. You know, sometimes even thinking, you know, we, some people have big dreams and everything. So I'll give you, and I, give, I think I gave that example the last time I came. Sometimes you may be a Deborah, and you can go out there, but sometimes you may be a Jael. And it is even in that your house that it looks like if I'm not doing so much. Women are, you know, going to war. Women are counseling, giving counsel under the, the tree. Women are, you know, Jael may have felt, she could have sat in the house and felt that way. That all I'm doing is building tents every day. We are moving. My husband will say, let's move. I'll move the tent. I'll build it again. Or I'm here just cooking, making milk. But those skills, those exact skills were the ones that brought the victory to Israel. Because it was that skill of knowing how to use hammer and tent peg that helped her to kill um, Cicera. It was that skill of hospitality that helped her to even get him to sleep. So nothing is wasted with God. I'm telling you nothing is wasted. Interestingly, before I got married, so I was in TV for some years, but I didn't like it. In fact, I felt like I wasted my time in TV. So I wanted to go into advertising. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, but by the time I now thought it was time to get married, I went back to school to do my master's, and I did my master's in international law and dipl diplomacy. And by that time, I started IUN UN work. And I was, I was planning to you know, move outside the country. I was dating someone who was living in the UK, so I was planning to you know, leave the country. So I had plans like that. But when I now met Pastor K, interestingly, it was that skill of being in TV that I thought was a waste. The relationships I built at that time was what helped us to now get on TV, and that was what blew up the ministry. So I don't think that there's anything that is wasted. 
Even the thing that you think is, well, I'm conforming to how my husband wants me to be, I'm conforming. I'll give you an example in my life. This is not me naturally. I did not, I, I hate stage. It makes me very uncomfortable. I'm only like this when I'm on stage. When I get off the stage, I'm extremely quiet, extremely introverted, very shy. So when I first got married, Pastor K really wanted me to do pulpit. He, like, he wanted me to be out there. He would tell me, there's too much in you to come and be standing on my back. You come and preach, do this. And he would do, he would do things that, in fact, those days I felt that they were mean. You know, so like, to be honest, every marriage at the beginning stage, you guys need to understand each other. So at that time, I, I thought my husband was very mean because he was very hard on me. Would be sitting in church, someone that doesn't want to preach. is when we're in church like this, he would now say, you are preaching second service. I'll say, you are, you are joking, Abby. Honey, please don't do like this. Honey, please don't do like this. He'll just do his face like this. I'll say, honey, you say, you're talking to your boss. i say, sir, I was just saying, sir, please now, please. And I would think he's joking. He will not have this conversation with me again. After service, he will go outside and be greeting people. Choir is singing special song. <laughs> and I'll tell him, go and call Pastor K outside. They will go and meet him. He'll say, no, Pastor M is preaching. Like, play, like, play, oh. I will preach that preaching, you know. And I will get home and I will suck and I will be, why would you do this to me? And then he will play, he will laugh, eh? Hey, you don't do it, I'm okay. But do you know that all those things were training for who I am today? So it may, you, if you can just tune in and look on the bright side, there must be something that you have developed over the years. It may be strength of character. It may be discipline. It may be patience. There's something you've learned through those years that if you place it in God's hands, God can still use it to bring glory into your life. So don't feel like you've wasted your life, you've wasted your time by being submissive. Let me tell you, when your own obedience is complete, God will avenge his obedience. So God will fight for you and he will compensate you. So don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you. This question, I don't know if it should be answered, but if I ask it, you know if it should be answered. He said, what do you do when your mother doesn't like your boyfriend? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I have a book out there. Okay, it's finished. Um, I love you, my parents say no. I don't know if that one is remaining. I love you, my parents say no. So I addressed it there. Um, the question is, why doesn't your mom like your boyfriend? That's the question. Why? If we can get to the why, then we can take it up from there. If it's a real reason, sometimes your parents' reason for not liking the person you're bringing is valid. It's valid because they know you. Maybe you have a history of making bad choices. <laughs> or they know what you are focusing on. Or, you know, they, so they might see something. My own question is first, why? That's number one. Number two, if your physical parents don't like your boyfriend, what of your spiritual parents? All right? I like to say that because your spiritual parents are objective. They are not liking or not liking because of tribe or things like that. They are objective. So if your physical parents don't agree, what are your spiritual parents saying? If your spiritual parents also don't agree in the amount of two or three witnesses, every word is established. It means something is definitely wrong somewhere. Okay? But if your spiritual parents agree, then you can take it from there and start to pray. Start to correct whatever notion your mom has. If it's tribal, then you know where to gather ammunition to deal with the tribal ideology. Okay, things like, begin to show them that some couples that married from the same, this is your same village, the ones that didn't work, show them. That's, so that's not what makes marriage work. Then if you have any uncles or aunties that have married other tribe that is working, show them. You are bringing, you are piling your case. All right, if you have relatives that can also talk to your mom and cool them down, show them. If you also have a way of melting your mom's heart, once in a while, if maybe you are going to do exam, uh, you need someone to prepare with you. Tell them, ah, is this boy you don't like that even help me pass this exam? Or? Be dropping those seats. Oh, this dress and wave. I like this dress. Ah, is that what you don't like that bought it? <laughs> Be dropping the seat. All right? So with prayer and patience and counsel from your spiritual parents, you know, um, it, should, it should go go on. It should work, yes. All right. Thank you. Put your hands together again. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask two more questions and we'll close for today. The question is, in the course of your teaching yesterday, you said something about watching out for Peters. So how do you manage a woman who does a, who does a lot of things, job, learning skills, but she doesn't get to focus on any, always abandoning it for the next 
which might also be abandoned along the line. That is jack of all trades. Okay. Do you want to say Okay, so I, I, it doesn't sound like you're already married. It sounds like you're still checking her out. I hope I'm correct. So um, if you're checking her out, you can do two things. Number one, sometimes you are the one sent to help that person. Maybe you are more stable. They are not. Um, work with her. So let's fix. Sit down and even cancel her. Sometimes she's, the thing she's doing eh, is not what she wants to do. There's another problem. There are people who have known that they are afraid of life, so they hide in school. So when they finish this university, they enter another they enter one. Another one. <laughs> so you see, the issue is not that they like school. The issue is that they are afraid to go and start life. So you need to find out why, why are you jumping from thing to thing. If it's that you're unstable generally, is this something I can help you with? Is this something we can work on? If you get to the root of the matter, start working on it. So cancel the person and find out what do you really like to do. All things being equal. Sometimes some people are doing things they know they can never do as a job. There are many jobs I can never do. So find, try and find something that is natural to them that they can do easily without stress. Once they find it, work on a program with them with miles. You see, the way life works, the organized person usually marries the scattered person. So you can help that scattered person organize. That's why you're in their life, really. So set milestones. Say, in next six months, next one year, these are the things that let's work together. See if you can help them stand. If you can help them stand, fine. If you can't help them stand and you feel you are rich enough, because life is a negotiation. Somebody that you can't marry, somebody has to go marry the person where, where. If you say, I'm rich enough for you to be playing anything you want to be doing, eh? jumping from place to place, my money is enough to run this family. There are homes like that. The woman is not doing anything. But there are also some other homes that need that woman's contribution. So you, you need to know what, is, what you can cope with. All right? Me, I need help. So somebody like me, I can't marry that woman because me, I need even somebody to help me. <laughs> but some other people, they have strength to help 30 people. So if you think you can carry it conveniently without complaining, you know, because she has already shown you her true color now. But if you know you can't handle it, eh? greet her very well and leave her. Somebody will come into her life that can either help her straighten up or handle her like that. All kinds of people marry, Pastor. The people that we, some of us think will never marry, somebody will come eh? and marry that mad person like that. And they will have a good time. So, if it's not working for you, go. If you can manage it, then manage it. But, you know, that's just what I think. All right. Let's appreciate God again. <laughs> Pastor, I would want to know what the kingdom stands, what the kingdom stand is for distant marriage. For an example, a spouse traveling overseas for greener pasture and leaving the, the wife and maybe a kid or two at home. Also, what would you give to, a, to couples in such an arrangement or considering such an arrangement? You know, a lot of people are looking for greener pasture, mm. traveling overseas mm. and all that, leaving their wife mm. or them sending their wife. Mm. So what's your advice? <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I just think it, when it comes to making money and prosperity, it's not as hard as people think. It's just that some people have locked in their mind that it's abroad or nothing. It's, life is not like that. You, you must consider all factors. The, those kind of decisions you are making, you, want, you are ready to sacrifice your children and your family for money. And I'm, it's men that usually do things like that. You know? So I, I think you should be careful. You, know, you should be careful of that action. Sarah did the same thing in terms of childbirth. She was willing to sacrifice, you know, the destiny of Israel over just having a child. So women also do it, but they do it more for family. Men do it more for money. You know, so be careful about it. The repercussion might be great. All right? So, um, however, if you want to do that kind of thing, many things must be clear. What's the plan? Many of these men, too, they want to go there and do arranging marriage and do many. You know, you, you are going deeper and deeper into a life of sin, something that me, I can never encourage you to do. Because it's not, it's not kingdom, it's not godly, it's not God's... See, what God cannot do does not exist. <laughs> it, it, prosperity is not from abroad, it's from above. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's money in Nigeria, you just don't know. But it's until your mindset can change. We have millionaires. Why do you think the richest people in Nigeria have not left this country? They can easily live now. They can buy a house and live abroad. I even be coming from abroad to work in Nigeria. They have private jets. Why, have, why do you think they've not left? Because they know there's money here. They know there's money here. That's why, why are white people still coming? 
go to airport international airport any every day of the week white people are trooping here what are they seeing that you are running to go and look for in their own country they are leaving the comfort where there's light and road and security to come to this our jungle to make money there's money here but your mindset has already locked into abroad so we need to change our mindset prosperity is not from abroad is from above you can earn foreign currency here I me mean, i do that regularly yeah. it's my way of life I earn it here. I don't have to go to America to earn dollars. I earn it right here. Is somebody get what I'm saying? Eh? Why don't you want to go and wash plates? Why? If that's not my gift. Except it's your gift. If it's not your gift, then... Yeah. So, it's a mindset you need to correct. Don't jeopardize or sacrifice your family life just for money. If it's this money you're talking about, you need to, if you line up with God and surrender to God, God can start showing you a way. To make it here. Now, if you must travel, there must be a clear plan. How long am I going to be separated? What's the plan for us to join back? Because once you go like that blindly, I've seen many couples, Pastor, and all of us have seen these things. Yeah. People that have gone and two years plan turned to ten, ten years, years plan turned to, uh, yeah. And I'm still canceling people that have gone like that and now have, now have children there. If you do, they have wife and you are scattering families. So you look like a small thing, but you are scattering families. It's never godly. So my own is that sit down, have a concrete plan. If you can't come up with a concrete plan, look, prosper here. Prosper here. There's money here. But go with your family, whatever you do, if you must go. Thank you very much, sir. This question, I'm so sympathetic about it. Mm -hmm. uh, not like I finished reading it. It's, it's, it's a long note. Um, it says... So who brought the fake news before? The same people. Please, his books, some of his books are still remaining. The other one was fake news. Obviously, Lai Mohammed announced it. It wasn't <laughs> present. It wasn't me. Um, I'm sorry he's not watching. Okay, I got married in November 2016 without knowing that the lady I got married to has gotten a child before our marriage. And she hid it from me. And when I discovered it, I asked her about it, and she confirmed it. And was, um, it was true, and said it was true. And she pleaded for forgiveness. And I forgave her and asked her about the father of the child. And she told me that the father of the child is in Lagos. Dear Pastor, only for me to find out that the father of the child stays close to my street. <laughs> and there has been series of communication between both of them, only for her to wake up one morning in August 2017 and left the marriage and also, and left the marriage and all effort to get her back proved abortive, and in 2020, I have to officially file for divorce. Dear Pastor, in the case, in, in case divorce and remarrying is, remarrying a sentence, is, is a sentence to, is he a sentence to hellfire? What should I do? <laughs> you, you did it late, my brother. All right, um, good question. Um, my first observation there is that how did you marry somebody you didn't know at all? You obviously don't know her well. Um, you see, and men make that common mistake. Men, men see all this marriage thing we are doing sometimes as a waste of time. What is this? But just choose any gay and marry. Now it be this way you enter. You should have, did you do counseling? Did you go through any process? Or you just pick any girl and marry? Because those are the things. How did you marry this girl and you don't know her at all? You... you if the way the kind of lie she's telling now, this is not somebody learning lying. lying. <laughs> so you were you were not observant at all. So I hope you have learned the lesson. Because sometimes people like you will go and repeat the same mistake. So let's start with you. Hope you have learned some lesson and follow marriage processes. Like we always say, don't marry somebody just you don't know who they who they are. Who church was she attending? Where are her pastors? Did she have this child in the secret? We are family members. You know, there are many things you didn't tell us here. I hope you didn't just go and hijack this girl from nowhere and marry. There are many layers of defense that God uses to protect us. Many of us, we skip those processes. We think we are deceiving God. We are deceiving ourselves. So that's number one. Number two, um, if she has left you, 
I said it all through this weekend. That's the only basis for divorce. If she has left you, she has practiced her rights for free will. If she has left you, you are absolutely free. The Bible is clear about that. If they don't believe in the part, the person remaining is free. It's for you that they created divorce, you that have been left. All right? So if you are, you are free, you can remarry. There's no crime in that. It's all through scripture that you can remarry. So you are absolutely fine in that case. Okay? Yeah. All right. I'm also recommending my book, the latest book, The Roots of Engagement. The rules of engagement because Una are address. You know they ask question. Mm. You see girl over yes. a meat pile in shop right. You just propose. propose. And <laughs> once you propose, your eyes is blind. blind. You're wearing a thick cargo. Mm. And then when you enter inside now, you're complaining, mm. seeing this, seeing that. Yes. Go and read that book called the rules of engagement and see the things you must do before you propose. Mm. Huh? Uh -huh. Don't uh, start looking for some newspaper to cover the proposal. Or a parachute that will throw you up as yes. you're landing your proposing and yes. dropping the ring. Yes. And all that. those things are rubbish. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Have you been blessed this evening? <laughs> Another question. When is our date next year? <laughs> no, it's when you give us the... You're the one that... You're the planner now, so... Uh, you are starting on time, so this is a good time to send us options of the date. So <laughs> we'll fill it in now. <laughs> Don't mind me. It's good to put them on the spot. <laughs> Let's appreciate Pastors K and Midrad Okonkwa. Put your hands together. Make some noise and appreciate these great talents. Praise God. 